Hey there, I'm Amanda, and I'm a personal growth coach living in Toronto, Ontario, and I am so excited to share with Pearl today. Hello, sunshine, good to see you again. Had to walk out to let you back in. Stuck in a storm of a relationship. Lost my fire. Oh, and I forgot. again and welcome to another conversation with Pearl and I'm so excited because as some of you have heard I have a couple of friends in Canada and here we are today with another amazing guest all the way from Canada and her name is Amanda Kirkland she is a self-professed practitioner of self-care you guys know we love self-care she is a babe which stands for balanced authentic babe extraordinaire narcissists and toxic relationships used to surround her like a magnetic field she estranged herself from her parents and one sister almost 10 years ago. And today she says her life is like 31 flavors of Baskin Robbins ice cream. I just like the Rocky Road. I'm good with that. So the younger version of Amanda was obsessed with reading books and watching movies about the guilty. At one point, she thought she wanted to be a criminal prosecutor or crown attorney, depending on what country you were living in. Turns out she didn't have the grades or the stomach for it. So Amanda got into real estate development for a short while. Now she is a professional, I'm sorry, she's now a personal growth coach, a yoga junkie, shopping fiend to the rival of Julie Roberts, who doesn't want to be that, obsessed a dog lover, and the style at home wannabe interior designer. Amanda's clients are strong women, and she has a few men in there who struggle with toxic relationships and want to start living their best lives on the terms of their own and by their own rules. Welcome to the show, Amanda. So excited to have you. I'm so excited to be here. So we were having some conversations ahead of time. So I know a little bit about your story, but what I'd love for you to share with the listeners is what brought you from being this one, you know, wanting to be an attorney and then starting to find yourself and realizing that you need to put some boundaries around your life and really to, to embrace and fall into what you see as your self-care. And so give us a little bit of a background of what what led you to the path of doing what you're doing today. Um, kind of came in the middle of the process or towards the end of the process, to be perfectly honest. Um, I was finished, I had a job in real estate development, senior level for almost 30 years. And the project I was working on was coming to an end. Um, I loved the work I did. It was not a particularly healthy work environment or happy work environment. And I had to decide whether to stay in the industry or figure out something else I wanted to do. And at, you know, in my early fifties, I didn't want to go backwards. I researched, um, staying in that field and I was going to have to take a substantial pay cut and then be reporting to various levels and commuting and working strict hours. And that's not what I was about. So I started going down the path of what do you like doing and enjoy doing? And what are you good at doing? And one of the things was organizing, doing, arranging, getting things done. So I had a concept of becoming a personal concierge, helping people, helping busy people. And I started working with a coach and I didn't know that coaching involved mindset work and reframing things and learning about myself and um we had a conversation one day and I was in tears and I was about to say you know to hell with all this because she's like you know what's your purpose and I'm like I don't have a bleeping purpose like and it was Kleenex after Kleenex bawling and she pushed and pushed and pushed and finally it was like I just fucking want to be happy and I said and I want people to be happy like I'm so tired and I'm like I and the word authentic somehow came up and it, although it has not served me well being 
what you see is what you get. I'd still rather be that than have Amanda at work and Amanda with friends and Amanda with loved ones. Um, and something just started clicking and shifting. And then the universe started just dropping a bunch of breadcrumbs and I followed them and um, I got certified with a company Avalon Empowerment. Uh, we do a lot of work with the unconscious mind. Um, I just sort of filter that into some of my own, you know, coaching programs. Um, so I did certification with them um, through not even really research, through process of elimination and honing in on who my ideal client was. Somehow I got the universe took me to working with people who are struggling with toxic relationships and it wasn't an I shouldn't say it wasn't until then but I suddenly realized that was the common theme in all the struggles I had from childhood forward and it started in the family um and now I've been able to put some pieces together um you know about my parents upbringing etc and what generational trauma is so i understand a lot better you know what happened to me and why i had the struggles i had um and if there'd been someone there to be able to show me these things and give me some tools and tell me something as simple as you cannot change other people um my life may have been very different i mean it is terrific now but it took an awfully long time to get here and I'm not a sort of cliche or woo-woo person but obviously I had to go through all that to be sitting here and you know invited in as a guest on podcast to share yeah that's I, I mean you know I like what you said too and we have we have to go through I, I love that you uh, took a coach to get you to you know to realize your passion and what you want it and to be able to say that and you know that was a blessing for you to have somebody like to show up in your life because a lot of people don't have that opportunity that that will push them to be like what is it you really want like what's that passion inside because i think what happens and you know we talked a little bit before coming on too about my my background my parents i think what happens is you know, we as kids, we believe our parents are all these be all, you know, end all. And then we're supposed to do everything they say. And so we walk that life. And then when we become adults and we we come up with other challenges, we have that narrative in our head that, you know, we've experienced. Well, this is how I have to be because they're an authority or they're older than me. You know, we, we and so it it doesn't serve us. And then we start suppressing who we in the core we want to be. We start losing like. Who, what is, who does Pearl want to be? Like, what is, what's Amanda's desires? And so, you know, for the listeners, that's why it's so important to find that mentor, find that coach or somebody that can be like, listen, what is it you really want? And like, make you break it down. And it's, it's freaking hard work to do it. You're going to, you're going to cry like Amanda shared with tons of tissues. You're going to scream. You're going to, you know, laugh. You're going to do all these things. But if you allow yourself to like push through this and push through all the stuff you've put down in the, in their belly for many, many years, you're going to walk through the other side with like, wow, I wanted to become a coach like Amanda, or I wanted to open a restaurant, or I wanted to be the president of the United States, whatever that is, you're going to have this empowerment now that says this, is, I'm going to go do this. And you were describing, we have what's called the Shiro um, league in, in our, um, in a small group of women that we, I coach every Sunday evening. And these are things we talk about is like, you have to deal with the stuff before you can really go and find and enjoy your joy. Yeah. You're happy. Yeah. You have some joy things, but if you don't deal with the stuff and, and really address the stuff, it's going to lead to other habits that you don't want, whether it's addiction, whether it's eating issues, what it's going to lead to other things. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm so glad that you had somebody to help you walk through that because now like you said, you're, you you found that passion of helping others that have had these tra traumatic relationships and, and such. So walk us through that. I know we talked, you know, part of your bio was about your relationship with your family. So as somebody who know, we, you and I have talked before, um, for those that are listening that haven't heard before, you know, we were very blessed to adopt our son, Matthew, at a month old. And 
he's mixed race. And, you know, my husband and I, we literally made a list of who, you know, before we committed to bringing Matthew in our family, we, we made a list of who in our family do we have concerns with that might turn races. And my dad popped up on the list some, but not high on the list. And then there were some friends. So we knew that bringing this child in, we were going to release people in our life. Never in a million years as a daddy's girl did I think I'd have to release my dad, even though he's way down on the list. It should have been a, a high priority in there. But, you know, my dad came to live with us for a little bit after my parents divorced. And then um, I found out later some of the things my dad said to my son, which were racist, which were hurtful and just not not right. And I literally sat in the car when I found this information out and wrote an obituary to my dad being alive. Like he's to him being alive as my father. Um, and then I called my son was Amanda and I said to him, you know, Hey, I just found this out. I'm really sorry as your mom, I didn't see it. And one of the blessings for me was that I knew I raised him great. My husband and I raised him great in understanding forgiveness because his comment was, it's not your fault. You didn't know, but I forgive him. And, you know, that was really for me powerful. And even years later, at one point I, he had said, you know, mom, if you ever want Papa to come back in, and I'm like, no, I, my boundaries are my boundaries. And, you know, I wanted to teach my kids that. So I'm mean, going to share your story and how you came to setting up these boundaries around your parents. And what, what's that? Like, what are some of the things you, the, the good things and the bad things that have come from doing that? Oh, the good things are how happy and light I feel. And finally, I guess with all the work I've done, it's brought, an amazing relationship into my life. Um, not that I haven't had any relationships, but nothing like this one. So um, that's pretty awesome. Um, you know, the you sticking up for your son and listening to that, I started to get a little uh, emotional because it brought back um, a situation where we were at the farm for a holiday weekend and there were friends over and their kids were there and they were two kind of odd duck fellows and they were very full of themselves and being pretty opinionated and a bit male chauvinistic and I've been used to working in a male dominated industry and I can hold my own no problem um I was in the throes of an eating disorder um so chemically and mentally I wasn't you know balanced and I went to, and I'd had a couple of glasses of wine because it was you know a holiday event um probably on an empty stomach and I went to my parents and I'm like can you please tell them to stop like can you talk to them or their parents like this is our house and I remember being really really agitated and my mother basically refused to do anything because it would embarrass her or them and I was so distraught. I got in the car and this was at night and I drove two and a half hours back to the city. So it was more important to keep up appearances than to stand up for me. And yeah, I, you know, I've never going to say I don't believe in drinking and driving. I'm like, I'll have one glass of wine. That was it. They should have never let me get on the road. And they did. And, you know, if I have to keep going for, you know, if I go backwards from there and forwards, whenever I came home and I was having a struggle, whether it was school, friends, a relationship at work, I was always to blame. It was never that somebody else's behavior um, may have been questionable or there was no support there. There was always something wrong with me. I wasn't born with the right coping skills. So that was kind of like, it was all covert and I didn't realize all these things would have such an effect on me going forward. And, you know, flash forward into the workforce. And like I said, I worked in a male dominated industry, had no problems, but I got triggered by a lot of people. And I didn't realize till I started doing the work on me um, that I was getting dressed every morning, ready to do battle and to get people to come away around to my way of thinking to change to win um and you know they say you don't know what you know till you know and 
now I know, and it may sound really simple, but you can't change other people. Um, and you do need to start to take accountability yourself, um, change the way you do things and make videos boundary settings. So you, you asked that about the family. I didn't know the word boundaries probably 12, 13 years ago when I started setting them. Um, I think I would have been too scared to set them verbally. Um, so I stopped going to the farm and I would only meet, you know, halfway on neutral territory for Father's Days and Christmases. And and um, I started putting boundaries on what discussions we could have. So we couldn't discuss money. We couldn't discuss weather. We couldn't discuss the three yellow pills my mother took daily. We couldn't discuss my sisters who weren't speaking to me at the time. Um, and one of those reasons is the negativity coming out of them at that point in their lives was just dragging me down. Um, anyway, I there wasn't one particular thing Thing that came to head where I finally went, that's it. I'm going no contact. Um, other than one of my sisters had an experience with them, sent a letter. Um, and like I said, she wasn't in contact with me at the time and shared some observations she'd made about my mother's behavior and my father's behavior. And I immediately opened up a private blog I'd written, um, sent her a few articles on narcissists and on being the black sheep which is what I was in the scapegoat and I think within a couple of days of us back and forth she said I had no I no she started she said I don't necessarily agree with what you said to mom and dad but I now or and did but now I understand why and then about three emails later it was like you know, I'm sorry you had to go through all that. And I, you know, what a long, lonely road and struggle it's been. And for one person to validate that, and, and now, in fact, I have had my cousin in England that, you know, we've had some back and forth with sharing some of the things she's gone through and understands about her family. It's not that I, I know I don't need validation now. I have confined most of that in myself. But to have all those pieces come together and know that there really wasn't anything wrong with me. And I don't know if it was when we were speaking before we started the podcast or at the beginning of this, you know, who I am today is who I should have been if I hadn't gone through the things I did. That said, we all go through things for a reason. Um, I don't necessarily think that's fair, <laughs> but it happens. And I think I had to go through those things to, to now be able to say, I don't want someone to lose 25, 30 years of their life um, struggling. So I think I've said enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, and you brought up a good point, too, because, you know, we look back and go, did I have to go through all of that just to get here? But I think it does. I think it, you know, it, it helps to find who we are. We have to go through whatever the stuff is we have to go through. And it's some of it really sucks. It's kind of like I described with my work with my clients that you know, these goals, I'm like you're going to climb a mountain, but at the top of the mountain, you have to come down. So you get to choose how you want to come down the mountain. You can fall down the mountain if you want to, or you can choose to say, I'm going to climb the mountain slowly. I'm going to take some lessons with me. I'm going to release some things that don't serve me. And when I get to the top, those are the things that are going to help me climb back down and not fall down. And, and so you can, you can start looking at peaks and valleys in our lives as, okay, these are lessons I have to learn and I can choose to let them define me or I can choose to let them change me and for the good or better, it's up to, it's our choice, right? It's certainly our choice. And, you know, and, and what's sad is that, you know, and you and I, I played a, I played a TikTok for Amanda before we got on about this gentleman was talking about, you know, we've never there's never a story we hear where parents don't have a relationship with their kids because, you know, they were trying to save money or they were trying to, you know, do good things for the kids. But there's something about when children choose to not have a relationship with their parents because of their behaviors, because we've learned through our, our challenges, how to set the boundaries and that, you know, if that person doesn't serve me, 
we those those of us that are the children of the parents that have got these boundaries around them sometimes we're looked at as like well you're bad those are your parents you should always love always love them and i used to think that amanda and years ago when my parents first divorced now my parents divorced i think i was in my early 40s maybe my late 30s and i remember i went to a, a re- women's retreat at church and one of the things we got to do was have a private conversation with our our priest at the time and I remember sitting with him and going, you know, I felt like this at that time, none of this stuff was happening that's happened um, because that all came later. But I remember saying that I feel like I've got these two parents that are at each other's throat. They're divorced, but they're still trying to put me in the middle and I don't want to be in the middle. And I'm just so frustrated. One thing he told me, and I have carried this forward always, and this is something you should write down listeners, is that. We don't pick our parents. Our parents are picked for us. But life is our ball game. And how we choose to play our ball game is up to us on what rules we make for the ball game. And and so sometimes, you know, again, we don't pick them. We love them, but sometimes they have to sit in the bench. And if you want to let them back in on the game off the bench, great, as long as they're following your rules. But if they can't find the rules, it's okay for them to sit permanently on the bench. It's not a problem. Because you're not doing anything wrong, but setting boundaries, set, setting those expectations of how you will allow others to treat you. And, you know, we have to do that sometimes. And Amanda, you share the example that that's what you've done too in your case. And, you know, I don't, I, I've many times, like right now, my son who passed, Matt, he has a really good friend who, she, he's in the middle of this situation with his daughter. And he, he is one of those young men that you would want your daughter to marry. You would want to be the ch- the father of your grandchildren because he just loves his daughter so much. The challenge is, is the 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 girl that he's going through all this ch- this custody issues with. They were never married, but they're you know have this custody issue. Is she's using the daughter as like this pawn? You know, oh, if you want to see her, put gas in my car. If you want to see her, I need groceries. Like all these things. So he has an attorney, but. I had a conversation with him. I said, I need you to get some cojones. I need you to step up for her because she's five years old. And if you don't do something now, these last next two years are, and what she's gone through so far with these five years, they're going to define the rest of her life on how she expects to be treated and how she should, you know, cower down to people and how she can be used. And, you know, I, I, I'm getting through to him and he's fighting, but, you know, it's so important that we do understand that this childhood trauma that we have as we get older, it still carries with us. And then when we become these adults and we do this work like you've done, Amanda, and I've done, it it brings it back to the surface. And like I said before, we can choose how we want to move forward with it. You can choose to have a relationship with whoever it is. It could be a sibling. It could be a parent. It could be a friend. Whoever that is, you have to put those boundaries around those relationships and you're in control of the gate whether the gate is open or not again and if somebody you know has anything to say about it, trust me i had people and i'm sure amanda you probably share too where we've had people say to me like i can't believe you're talking or treating them i, I can't believe we'll call them blah, blah, blah. i'm like i'm okay with that and listeners are probably going i'm going to address this too i've had somebody say to me well what happens if he dies and i'm like well in my book right now he's already passed because nobody that was my father would have treated my son that way. So really in my book, he has passed. He's just, his name is just X, Y, Z name. And and if he passes, you know, I wish him well, you know, I don't want any ill will on him, but you know, those are things that as children who have boundaries around our parents or siblings or whatever that is, you know, I don't want anybody to think that we don't think, gosh, I wish it could be better because certainly I wish it could be better, but it's not. And it's not our choice it's our choice to have the boundaries around us, but it's their choice to do the behaviors. 100%. Yeah, it is. And um, I mean, it, at the beginning, it was really difficult explaining to people. Um, you know, I'd run into someone, they'd say, how are your parents? And I'm like, um, I'm actually estranged from them. And the look of horror I remember it was one of their friends once that they probably hadn't seen in a while. She just looked disgusted with me. And then it happened another time. And that woman almost looked like she could get it a little bit. Um, But I'm not angry. I'm not bitter. I'm 
disappointed. Um, I had a picture perfect childhood. I mean, we really didn't want for anything. And I didn't realize how much, you know, I went home every night for three years in high school and bawled my eyes out because I was so unhappy at the school. I didn't like it. I wanted to go to public school, not private school. And I was told I almost gave my mother a nervous breakdown. Like, listen to what your kids are saying to you. Um, I don't know where that, some of the stuff in these podcasts is so cool because the weirdest stuff just kind of pops out. Um, but it was, uh, I, I wrote an article actually uh, from lo local magazine I contribute to, and it was called Framily. Um, and I remember years ago, my uh, therapist telling me that it's it's the exception, not the rule, that um, family or friends. So, you know, society thinks it should be one way and it is really frowned upon. But, you know, my sister and I have talked about it before. If it was an abusive relationship, are you going to tell the male or female that they need to go back because they were married? Because that's what you're telling me to do if I need to go back to a dysfunctional family dynamic that I know is not going to change. So the answer is no. Um, you know, on my coaching, my go-to is not to tell someone to estrange themselves. I mean, some of my clients are already at that, you know, have done that. Some are just having difficulty in those situations. Um, I know in one of my coaching programs I was in, there was another girl in there and much younger than me um, had a very difficult relationship with her family and she started using the tools that we were learning and trained in um, to adjust her behavior and I remember her coming on a call one day and the relationship with her her parents did a 180 and it was pretty emotional for me because at the time I was like oh does that mean you're supposed to tell me that if I change my or I should change my behavior and open the door again um and that wasn't what was being said but I've seen firsthand how just making adjustments in your own behavior um can change the trajectory and the outcome of a lot of situations and I think that's a good point too. It's not to say that it can't change, but you know, they also have to want to make those changes. They have to meet you where you're at and be like, okay, can we talk? Can we have a conversation um, about, you know, what's on your mind? And, you know, my husband and I, in our relationship, one of the things we, we, when I first met him, I didn't know communication. So when my parents would get in an argument, they just wouldn't talk for two weeks. And then all of a sudden everything was fine. I'm like going, what happened? Like that was the example I had. So when I met my husband and, you know, we had disagreement or something like that, I would just ignore him. I would just shut down. That's all I knew. And then he started going, well, if you don't tell me, I can't, I can't fix anything or help you. Or I can't understand what's on your mind. And so he got to the point where he's like, well, she's not responding. So I'm going to answer for her. And he would start having conversations for me and he would answer for me. I'm like, I wasn't going to say that. That's not what I was going to say in that situation. And so I learned communication because of him, but I didn't have that example. So, you know, when, with my mom, you know, my mom got very um, adamant and she held this, you know, this animosity to me because at one point in my life, my dad had come and lived with us. And in her mind, for whatever reason, I, mean, I was in my forties. I don't have to tell her he's living with me that, she just was like, well, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to tell you things. I mean, to the point that she had surgery and things like that. And I used to say, I don't tell him things about you. And I'm not going to tell you things about him to the point that when he got married, I didn't call my mother. It's not her business. Right. So she happens to call me when I'm driving home from his wedding reception. She's like, hey, what are you doing? I'm like driving home because I was doing that. I was driving home. I heard your dad got married. I'm like, oh, he did? Like, I just was like, I'm not going to confirm or deny anything. You're not going to pull me into this emotional thing, right? And she's like, well, yeah. I'm like, well, you don't want to know things. So example A of I don't tell you things, you know, and but she still held, held this. And you and I talked about this before we got on here. She still held this, you know, animosity to me to the point that my brother had seen it um, a, over a year ago. And he called her out on it and she admitted without saying it, you know, she probably thinks it's because she let her dad move in. I'm like, I didn't even have to say that, mom, you just confirmed your feelings. 
And it's fine if you were, you know, to me, like I told her, it's fine if it upset you. And at the same time, you shouldn't, you can't hold it against me. I'm in my forties. I'm not a little girl that has to still do what mommy and daddy say. And I think for my situation, that was my parents' issues too. And I think to this day, my mom is still that way that, well, I'm your mom. We're 20 years apart from each other. You need to speak to me in this tone. It's like, or do, or treat me this way, you know? And, and so, you know, it's not to say we can't mend these relationships. Like I've worked with my relationship with my mom. Um, we just had something recently that came back up. So she's got a little more boundaries around her again. But to listeners, what we're saying here, Amanda, are saying that it doesn't mean you can't mend a relationship. But what we're saying is, as Amanda said, we would never, ever ask somebody to go back to an abusive situation. So why would we expect children or anybody to go back to any kind of relationship that they were treated in a narcissist way or treated, you know, in a, an abusive manner that's not healthy for that person? And I think what happens is we look at those relationships as, well, this is parents and this is every other relationship. And we have to look at them that they're all the same, that they're all the same. Um, I'll give another example. I have a really, I, I had a really good friend. Um, we became fast friends. I was everywhere to be seen with her. Um, she was in a relationship that ended. My husband and I opened our doors in our house for her and her son to come stay with us. And she went away on this retreat and something happened. And when she came home, um, you know, I, I asked her about it because I was concerned and some things that she had brought home with her. Um, and her comment to me was a very, you know, sad thing about people dying all the time. And I was like, yeah, no, that doesn't line up with what I believe in. And so I asked her to leave. And again, that was because I have boundaries. And I think one of the things we have to take from this episode today is that you have to have boundaries and they need to be healthy boundaries and they need to be around relationships as well. And so, Amanda, what I want to know is, you know, as you work with your clients, like, how do you help them accept, you know, because it's hard, we, you know, we're, we're kids, no matter what, we're still that little girl inside, that little boy inside, we want our parents to love us, there's always that, you know, that feeling of why don't you love me, or why don't you treat me better, and so as we, as we walk through what we're talking about, it, it's really hard, because that little girl or that little child is still going, but what if sometimes, so you know, it took me a while to go through no more what ifs, this is what's happening. And so how do you help your clients like walk through that acceptance and that reality of the of relationships, like especially with parents that are, you know, possibly have to have these strict boundaries around them? Um, a lot of it. I mean, first of all, it takes time. It's It's not a matter of just you know, I have an ebook that's four secrets strong, gritty women need to know to rise above toxic relationships where I, you know, there's something on boundary setting, saying no communication 101. I mean, it's fine to read the stuff and be taught that, um, to put it into practice repeatedly. Um, that's one of the reasons coaching is great because you've got, you know, we walk beside our clients and we hold them accountable and we don't take their shit and we put consequences in place you know, if they're not going to do the tasks or, you know, use the new strategies we've, we've given them to deal with certain situations. Um, I think, so there's practice, there's, you know, having somebody holding you accountable, working with you, because you could read all the books in the world, listen to all the podcasts in the world, um, do all the armchair therapy in the world, but it doesn't quite get you over that last, I guess, hurdle when you're, when you realize, I mean, not everybody wants to heal and get better. And, um, and then I think the other big part, um, you know, is, is starting to, it's changing the mindset and knowing that, you know, in the case of parents, they did the best that they could with the tools they had at the time. And then, you know, you take it one step further back and you know what I kind of had pieced together about my grandparents and then how that affected my mother um it starts to make sense so you know when you realize you know it's it's another saying the person is not their behavior there's stuff that's gone on that causes you know I've gone into border meetings and everybody's sitting around the table table egos checked i'm supposed to run it 
And then there's, you know, the, I'm going to say the guy with the short man complex, no offense if there's any male listeners, um, who starts being overbearing and all about him and, you know, pounding his chest. And I, the first thing I do was try to put him in his place, or I should say I did was put him in his place. And, you know, there's a force of wills going on. Um, I walk into a room now and I see someone behaving that way. And I think about what's behind that behavior. And I'm not going to get, I'm not going to react. First of all, I'm going to respond differently. Um, You know, my body language would be different. And this is all things that, you know, I wish I'd been aware of when I was in those situations. So, you know, those tools and giving, you know, real life examples. And that's one of the reasons, um, you know, not that I love what I'm doing. I do love what I'm doing, but I'm not just trained in some things. I've got the lived experience. So I can take, you know, clients through certain scenarios and what ifs and like, okay, so you tell me what happened in this particular instance, and then we can walk it forward and how you want that to look tomorrow or next time. Yeah. And, you know, I also too, like to understand, I love how you talk about you help them walk through and walk through the what ifs and break it all down. You know, it's, I'm 58 years young. And so I always talk about, you know, oftentimes like our parents didn't have great examples of, you know, because my granny worked all day and my grandfather was away at the sur- at the war, you know, and then my dad, same thing. My dad was, you know, did three tours in Vietnam and then he's coming back and forth. And I've had people say, well, you know, because of the war, I'm like, no, that's not an excuse to treat me and, and, you know, the way that I was treated or my son was treated or what have you. But to understand that I'm glad today there's a lot more. And I think if anything came out of COVID, there's a lot more mental wellness awareness because we talk about these things now and we talk about getting our kids help and we're doing it younger and, you know, watching, you know, watching young moms like on these YouTubes and TikToks and stuff, teaching their kids at little ages to like positive affirmations and things like that. And like you said something earlier, it's like listening to our kids, like, we, that's something like right now, if there's a parent listening, if we, if I could say anything and back up what Amanda said as well, is that we have to listen to our kids. Like, even though they come home and you think, oh, that's so silly, or that's just kids being kids. No, listen to it. Walk them through it. Ask them how that makes them feel. Ask them, well, you know, what if, what if it was, you know, ask what ifs, ask the questions that aren't yes or no answers like inquire on their feelings inquire well how did you feel when johnny said such and such to you or, yeah, or just, whatever. it's so important not to invalidate and right. you know in hindsight i know that's what was happening to me with friendships in the family in the workplace yeah and it's it's really important i remember when i was um first starting in the work field um i i would get very emotional sometimes i would get upset like you know, to the point my boss like, okay, you're allowed to come in here, but you're not allowed to cry. I'm like, you have to validate at that one point. I remember going, you have to understand how I'm, how I'm feeling. You know, I was trying to, you know, explain, but I, my thing was, it was the communication. I didn't know how to communicate when something bothered me, like I said, from, you know, before I met my husband. So yeah, we have to, you know, as parents really listen and ask questions, open the questions, open the conversation. Um, I'm actually part of um, a great, a great um, nonprofit called Unsilenced Voices, and it brings awareness to human trafficking and uh, domestic violence. And it's one of the things is, you know, have your eyes open to what your kids are doing. Be aware of what's happening around their surroundings and be involved. You know, oftentimes we let them sit behind their game systems or what happened. And sometimes that's what's right in front of you is that, you know, that issue. And so I, I like that you help also the clients understand it takes time. It's not something that happens overnight. It's not something that you go, okay, I'm going to do this and you feel better. I mean, there's times, you know, that would I like to call my dad and be like, Hey, you know, yeah, sure. There's things that happen. And, you know, my younger son is dating an amazing girl and he'll probably get married that he's, um, you know, buying and they're trying to buy their first house. Those are things that, you know, as our grandparents, I would love to know, for them to be part of. And, you know, and they're just not. And for me, when when I did set these boundaries around my parents, one thing I did to make sure 
is especially with my dad, I'm like, I'm not telling you, I don't want you involved with your grandchildren. You are more than welcome to be involved with them. You know, um, th- they were younger, so they weren't 18 yet. So, but there'll be some boundaries around that. You know, I'm not going to keep them from you because I want them to know their grandparents. But my dad chose not to. So that was his choice, you know, and oftentimes we get forced to make a choice that we're not wanting to make, you know, and, but it's the best thing for us. And so I'm glad that you also reminded us that it also takes time, you know, just like with any, just with ourselves, just having a relationship with ourselves, you know, in the Shiro League, we talk about, you know, finding the strength and be, becoming strong enough to put yourself first, to overcome being a people pleaser, because, you know, for so many years, you may have been that person that said yes to everybody else, but no to yourself. And so, you know, as you walk through and you become stronger, you start to find a, you start feeling that feeling of happiness inside. Like you get that, a little bit of that joy starts stirring up and you start feeling happier because you're strong enough now to say, I have boundaries. I need my self care. I'm not going to say yes to all this or yes to this situation. And then that ease, you become empowered. You, you know, you have this new strength, you're feeling happy. You're empowered to say, I want to go start a business. I want like a man, I want to go start my coaching business and share my message. You know, I don't like being a stay at home mom. I want to go back to the workforce. You have that empowerment now that you feel like your voice can be heard. And then the R is stands for radiant where you're, you know, you're glowing up because you're stepping into all of these things that you have kind of put aside for a while there because you allowed everybody else to control your feelings. And then then that O is you become that original self. You, you know, earlier, I mean, I think you led to authentic self. I love original, um, but it's also known as authentic because I feel like we're always that original person was always there. But because we go through things like relationships with our parents or relationships with loved ones or our friends or whatever that is, we push it down and we forget to, to, you know, nurture that. And as we start nurturing it, then we have this whole new outlook on life. And we, you know, we walk around with our cape so tight around us that we can button it back because we've got this, you know, this, this power of taking care of ourselves first. And, and that includes boundaries. Like we're talking today with Amanda about, you know, around family jobs, whatever that, whatever that is. And, you know, it's, it's really, really powerful. So I want to know, Amanda, tell me about Babe, Balance, Authentic, Babe, Extraordinaire. So walk us through that a little bit. Well, it was originally Bitch. Um, and I can't remember what the acronym was for it, but it was Babe something, something, something. Um, and as I started getting more into my coaching work and continuing on my own journey um it didn't it didn't resonate with me anymore um I've always been told I was unapproachable um a real estate agent I worked with a few years ago called me gritty um and it wasn't in a good way it was in a negative way um and I kind of was like okay so I'm unapproachable I'm gritty um and I'm not those things really underneath. I started, people started responding to me differently. I'd have, you know, I'd post something on Facebook that was, I don't know, different than people saw me before, but I started getting like, oh my God, you look so cute. Well, the word cute and Amanda did not ever go together. Now, you know what? I can be cute and have fun and you know laugh a lot more so the bitch became babe um and you know it's it's not a stroke myself or pat myself on the back by any means it's just supposed to be something fun and I like using it in my signature because you know it catches people's attention I've had a few people that are like why did you change it the babe bitch was so much better and I'm like because if I've got potential clients I don't want them to be scared off that I'm, I mean, I'm what you see is what you get. I'm not formal. I'm very like chill and relaxed, probably sometimes too much. So, um, but yeah, so it's transitioned to babe, which was kind of just like, like I said, you were talking about original self. And I think earlier I had made the comment about, you know, I'm, finally being able to become and be who I was meant to be had I not 
gone through what I went through. Um, and there's no crying over spilt milk. I'm, you know, day to day, I'm moving forward. Um, so I hope that answered. Yeah, no, and it reminds me too, like you, the no crying over spilt milk. I often tell my clients, life's not a remote, you can't rewind it. So you can decide how you're going to use it going forward. What What's the TV show you're going to play in your in your life going forward and or movie you want to play out. And so that's so, so important. Um, so one of the things, Amanda, that in our Shiro League, which I said, this is a group of women we meet from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern time. And we work on things, you know, that bring us joy. We work on overcoming challenges. We work on setting boundaries, all these great things that do with self-care. And so one of the things that we're working on right now with them is the word joy and what brings you joy. And so it's not just, you know, joy, like they had to create a list of 10 things and it couldn't just be, oh, well, I, I have joy because I like my job. Well, why do you like your job? Like, what about it? What if you didn't have the job? Would you still be happy? You know, we break that down. And so, Amanda, I have a question for you. And that is, if you had to give the listeners your top three things that bring you joy, what are they and why do they bring you joy? Um, sun and heat bring me joy. Bet you didn't expect that one. Why? I just, it just feels good. And it feels good to feel good to have that sunshine, that heat hitting your body. And, um, you know, normally when you're in that temperature zone, you're outside and you're free. Um, the relationship I have now brings me joy. Uh, he tells me he loves me. He loves me more. -er -er. Um, tells me I'm beautiful. Um, not used to hearing those things. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's really nice. Um, and then my 15 year old Yorkshire Terrier, and I'm getting teary eyed over that one. Cause she just turned 15 and she's been with me through all of this. That's so sweet. Yeah. I Sorry. mean, I didn't, no, I didn't no, mean to no, get in that room. No, you're totally fine. And you know, you're, let me just say to your boyfriend, yes, the warmth, I expected you to say that because I know you're in Canada. So I know it gets cold there. Pretty quickly. <laughs> I wasn't surprised you said that. But you know, too, when we find somebody who loves us for who we are, and they recognize that, that these beautiful people that we are inside, it's so overwhelming and so beautiful to have that in our life. And everybody deserves to have that in their life. And if you're not feeling like that, you know, please reach out because I'd love to, you know, help you walk through that. But and then I get your dog. I might, you know, my son, when he passed last year, his dog Rico will be 10 next year. But our other dog, she's a Yorkshire Terrier. She's going to be, I want to say she's almost 15 years old as well. So we think it's a Yorkie too. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, and we know they're little and we know, you know, we don't have a lot of time with them, but like, especially Rico, before my son passed, I did not want dogs sleeping in my bed. That they, it was a no, no. And my son's dog Rico would sleep with him all the time. And so when Matt passed, all of a sudden, you know, he's sleeping with me and he, he, he really felt the loss of my son a lot. Like you could see him moping around looking for him. And he knew like, it wasn't like before when he'd gone away to college, but like he, he knew this permanent feeling in the house. And so, um, so he sleeps with me every night now. So it's just, it's kind of crazy that that's happened. So, um, but yeah, thank you for sharing those three joys. Now here's the, here's a tough question. So we make lists for the grocery store. We make lists for things we got to do around the house. We make lists to, to, you know, for just about everything, right? But oftentimes we don't create a not to do list. And that list is of things that we have to stop doing because they're keeping us from going outside, spending time with or finding somebody that's going to love us for who we are and also enjoying, you know, our little, our little animals or whatever it is that brings you joy. So, on that not to do list, Amanda, what do you have to put on that list that you stop doing so you can enjoy those things you love more? Uh, worrying that I've done something wrong. Um, worrying about what other people think of me. Um, and. I, I don't know what the the third one would be. I think a lot of them are just about me always worrying I've done something wrong and, you know, the people don't like me, um, which is kind of another way of what people think about me. 
um, those were just so present in my everyday life for years and years and years. Right. Um, now I'll still get, you know, activated or triggered once in a while by certain things, but I'm aware of it now. So, you know, that's the other thing with the work with the clients is just bringing your awareness about certain situations. Like things would have taken me out for weeks at a time before that it happened. And I'd be talking to everybody about, you know, my shit. Now when something happens, I can catch myself before I go down that rabbit hole. I can sort of run, how is it a problem through my head? Um, And yeah, sort of get myself back in the game in an hour instead of, you know, losing time and and breath and dragging other people down. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, for me, my big thing is the shoulds, you know, especially with the loss of my son, I should have done this more, should have done that more. You know, we were very, very lucky to talk to him 20 minutes before he passed. So I was able to say, we, my husband and I both will say, we love you, you know? So for me, had I not been able to do that, I don't know how I would have responded. And then also the day before he passed, he was here at the house um, because he was living with his girlfriend. So he was here at the house doing some stuff with my husband and I, I remember like the fun memory I have is throwing him a bottle of water and it fall. And he's like, I told you, you never had good aim, you know, so those kind of things, but the shoulds is a big one for me as well. So I want to thank you for playing around because that's not always easy. And that's really what, you know, in our Shiro League and our Shiro Method course, we go through those things. We create that roadmap of what's those joy, what's those not to do list and, and to remove those. So I want to thank you for playing along. So now Amanda, tell everybody, let everybody know, I know you have a freebie, so let everybody know about your freebie and then also share with them how they can find you. Uh, you can find me on social media, so Facebook and Instagram at Amanda Kirkland Coach. And I do have a freebie, an ebook, and that I mentioned earlier on, and it's uh, Four Secrets Strong Gritty Women Need to Know to Rise Above Toxic Relationships Without Hours of Therapy in brackets um it's a quick easy read there's some tools in there there's a couple of before and after scenarios that i uh i alluded to one um those are based on what happened in my life and then what the situation would look like using some of the tools um that i have now so the afters didn't happen to me but they would (laughs) have had i known what i know now That's awesome. And we're going to put all those links in so everybody can grab those. Just read all the comments. Um, you can grab those. So now Amanda knows we're going to do better questions, better life cards right now. And so I'm going to shuffle another these. Hard one. <laughs> <laughs> we pre-did one earlier. Um, so we're going to shuffle them. Amanda's going to tell me when to stop. We're going to read her card to her. So here we go, Miss Amanda. Tell me when to stop. Stop. So your question is, are your actions aligned with your words? So are your actions aligned with your words? 100%. Absolutely. Everything right now is, is all in the right place and makes sense. And the puzzles all in one piece. Um, so yes, I'm completely 100% in alignment, actions, words, thoughts, And, you know, I got that from Amanda, just watching her. So those are listening. When you watch this on YouTube at Conversations with Pearl, you'll see she's, I got that right away. I knew when I saw that car, I'm like, oh, I know the answer right away. So (laughs) it's awesome. And um, so I just want to remind everybody, Amanda, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story. And, you know, we talked about a lot of some hard stuff here today, you guys. And if you're parents and you have little ones, you're probably going, Oh, I hope my kids never not talk to me. And so it's never too late. It's never too late to listen to them. It's never too late to open the door of conversations. One of the things I used to do with my kids when they were younger is I created every week, each one of my boys, we had time together. So I would take them separately to go for lunch or whatever it might be. As my sons got older, uh, my older son would be like, hey, mom, do you want to go for sushi? And that's when I knew he wanted to talk. And when my younger one would say, do you want to go for a movie? That's when I knew he needed to talk. So create that table talk environment. And when you do that, 
make it so that no matter what they tell you, there's no punishment. Like tell me whatever's on your mind, have an open mind and let them share with you no matter what it is. As they get older, it could be sex and drugs. Just know that's what that could share with you, but have an open mind to how can I help you in that? How can I support you in, in that? Because the last thing you want to do is not be a great listener for your kids in this world that we're in today. So I hope you guys enjoy the episode. I want to remind you that if you want to, we still have a few spots left at our retreat. Our pajama retreat is September 14th to the 18th. We're in the Gulf Shores of Alabama. Easy packing. You can arrive and leave in what you, you come and go with. And all you need is a couple of pairs of PJs and no makeup because it's a no makeup pajama retreat where we're going to work on self-care, self-development and learning some tools to keep yourself as that Shiro you are. So just remember, as you come into this world, you are this rough oyster. You have a lot of work to do to smooth it out and be able to open it up. But on the inside, you are this inner pearl. And I hope you go find your inner pearl of greatness. Have an amazing day. Sunshine, good to see you again. Had to walk out to let you back in. Stuck in a storm.